Good evening. I hope you can hear me well. And I hope you can also um, see my screen. I'm just getting things up and running here. So hopefully we don't have any problems with technology because um, I'll, I'll, I'm still a little bit new to this. So I, I ask for your indulgence. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is just to share with you, there's this wonderful book and I hope you can see it on the side of my first slide. It's called, It's Not That Simple. And it was one of the books that was published by um, the DeWaber Institute with some amazing uh, contributors. And if you haven't read it, I would put a plug in to um, encourage you to pick up the book and, uh, and go through it because there's some wonderful um, information there that can be very helpful. Um, over the next few minutes that I have, what I wanted to do is, um, or want to do is to go over the foundations of palliative care, a little bit about philosophy and practice of a palliative care, and then some desired outcomes. And I too am going to build on what was said last night by the other physicians um, in our group. Um, and hopefully um, I have some good answers to some of the questions that you may have um, when we con come to a conclusion. So the first thing I wanted to say and share with you um, is that, and I'm quite proud of the fact that um, the person who created the term palliative care is Dr. Balfour Mont, um, who is a Canadian who, as you can see from the cardigan he's wearing, he's, was from Queen's University, but he is actually more associated with uh, McGill University. And those who are involved in palliative care would know that every two years, I believe, there's an amazing conference that takes place in Montreal um, centered around um, the foundations of his work. And one of the things that he had a vision of was the vision of whole person care. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. And, and the other person that um, I have, how do I say, somebody I admire very much, and I've um, oftentimes quoted her. Um, if you've ever, ever seen me present in terms of palliative care before, you know that um, I put this um, quote of hers in my uh, presentations. You matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but to live until you die. Um, Dame Cecily Sanders, by the way, was the founder of the modern hospice uh, movement. Interesting is um, some of our colleagues had said already about um, we need assisted living. And if we're gonna help you live until you die, we do need that assisted living. Um, one of the things that both um, Dr. Belfermont and Dame Cicely Sanders had in common was the belief in the concept of total pain. And in this quote also from Dame Cicely Sanders, suffering may be related to the pathophysiology of a disease, but it is always modified by the psychosocial, spiritual aspects of suffering. And I wanna just, uh, and that's by the way, in the lower right-hand corner, you will see a picture of St. Christopher's Hospice, uh, which he founded. And um, Dr. Belfermont went there and had to roll up his sleeves and um, learn about the patient she was working with. And um, she didn't want him flying in for a weekend. I think he had to go in there for at least a week and, and learn from the experience of that particular hospice. Um, but both of them had this um, very important notion of total pain and that we need to address total pain in palliative care. And I think um, anybody who's educated in healthcare, educated in, in palliative care in particular, will know about uh, total pain. And of course, it makes sense when you look at this simple graphic that, of course, we need to look at what's, what are the physical issues that the person is dealing with? What are the social issues? What are the psychological? And what are the spiritual? And if some of those domains like social or spiritual or psychological are heavily stressed at any given point in time, that too can impact on the physical. And I think of a situation like a young man who had a cancer diagnosis, it was terminal, and he was the breadwinner for his family. And he was very worried about how would he pay the bills for his family. He had medical um, coverage through his workplace insurance, but now that he's not able to work, how would he provide for medications, not only for himself, but also for his family. And of course, this alone was causing him a lot of stress around how will the bills get paid. Now, when we think about palliative care, we think about palliative care as being a team effort. And certainly um, in this particular situation, a referral to a social worker would be very important because that social worker could sit down with the, this family, with the person and look at what are the challenges they, challenges they have, what are the resources they have, and then look at 
what might they uh, be offered in terms of uh, support so that um, the medications can be covered and so that bills can be paid and hopefully rent or mortgage can at least be covered and also to help to plan for the future when, when the parent was not there anymore and who might be there to, um, or how supports might be available to them. And you can imagine if the social worker is present in the to addressing total pain, some of the uh, physical stresses that this person would have would be diminished because you could see that they would be really tensed and stressed thinking about how am I going to pay my bills? But if that stress is removed, then even the physical side of that person's um, situation can be modified. Uh, by the way, la last night I was uh, very, um, uh, I enjoyed uh, um, hearing the physician speak and uh, Dr. Bouchard, I think put a note about uh, recreational therapists. And I added a note in the chat about the importance of recreational therapy and how recreational therapists uh, through their engagement with our patients can help, for example, with distracting from pain, distracting from the stresses that the person may be experiencing through artwork and through other activities that can be very helpful. And then one, the one situation that I was quite familiar, um, the patient felt a loss of meaning and purpose actually due to a stroke. Um, and, and her meaning and purpose in life was largely around the fact that she loved to crochet. And because of the stroke, she couldn't uh, crochet anymore. And so she became depressed. Her affect was suppressed, depressed. And we tried all different kinds of therapies and counselors, et cetera, but nobody had a breakthrough. But somebody, a brilliant person asked for um, a recreational therapist to be involved in the care. And that person found a way for the, the uh, crochet hook to be mounted on the bedside table. And that person was able to use her one hand and start crocheting again. And when she was using the one hand and seeing that she was able to create lines of yarn, um, she started to regain um, her affect in a more positive way. And that turned the situation around where she became a rehab candidate. And from the rehab, um, can, um, admission to rehab, rehabilitation, she then was able to go home. And so a team member who we don't always think about, like a recreational therapist, made a big difference for this particular person. I will also say that um, spiritual, dealing with the spiritual side of um, total pain is very important. You know, sometimes we may have uh, formal religious affiliations that are important, um, traditions that we have to, we want to carry out when somebody is dying, but sometimes we may not have a spiritual, um, a formal side of, um, a formal spirituality that uh, we adhere to. And so we can work with people around telling their life histories, putting those together. And sometimes we may find that there are reconciliations that can be helpful and, um, and how many times, even in our own lives, sometimes we've had fights with family members or fight with, with friends over silly things. And if we have an opportunity to seek reconciliation, we can be at peace. And so when we are able to address social, psychological, spiritual, then we can also help to modify the physical experience that the person is having, perhaps even um, having the need for fewer um, medications. Now, one of the things I wanted to share with you is, I mean, I, I've been doing work with Ontario Palliative Care Network, with Hospice Palliative Care Association of Canada. And one of the terms that we use now is um, palliative care is disease agnostic. And I'll share with you what I mean by that in, just, um, in this slide here. I hope I'm not moving too fast because I know in some computers, the transitions are not as good with, um, with Zoom. But in the first wave of palliative care, it was largely focused on cancer care. Uh, and we were doing good with that. And, 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 and Dr. Belfermont and, and Dame Cicely Sanders, for example, did some tremendous work with cancer care and palliative care. Um, and then the second wave um, was uh, the wave in which we saw people with HIV and AIDS. And if you look at um, here in the city of Toronto, a well-known hospice is Casey House. Um, so they had the first wave of cancer, the second wave with, wave with um, HIV AIDS, but now we're in this third wave, which we would call disease agnostic because it's inclusive of all end stage diseases. You know, sometimes we may be thinking, oh, palliative care is just for cancer care. No, uh, palliative care is for, can be for all end stage diseases like heart disease, like kidney disease, like dementia, like ALS, to name just a few. I mean, it's not uncommon for people to have a heart attack, they survive the heart attack, but they may have some difficulties afterwards with, with their heart function. 
and they will need support as they go through their illness trajectory. So this is what we say when we say that palliative care is disease agnostic. And because it's open to many diseases, um, I want to encourage us as a public to be more comfortable with seeking referrals and, um, and accepting referrals when palliative care is made uh, for uh, uh, people with end-stage diseases. Now, what I want to do in just a moment is share with you what is oftentimes referred to as an integrative palliative care model. Uh, some people call this the bow tie model, uh, um, illustra illustrating how we would like to see palliative care provided. And if you notice on the left side of, the, of this illustration, you see the words cure and control. And so the, when the person is newly diagnosed with a, a life-threatening illness, a life-limiting illness, um, they're going to go and have your have therapies. Maybe if it's cancer, may have um, immunotherapies, chemotherapy, et cetera, radiation therapy. And so we're going to try to do our best to do to do cure, and do management and do control. But if you notice at the end, uh, in that sort of overlapping pink, palliative care is there, but it's just at the beginning and may not be that much involved. And in the early stages of palliative care involvement, um, this is where we can start encouraging people to think about advanced care planning, to think about what would their wishes be? What would their values be? And one of the very important roles of um, the palliative care team is just letting people know that they're not alone. There's somebody there with them on the journey. And this can be, re be very, very reassuring. But as you notice with that particular illustration again, that as the illness um, trajectory moves forward and maybe they're moving towards the latter part of their life, palliative care becomes more and more involved where the cure and control becomes less and less involved. And of course, you may see like admissions to a palliative care unit or admissions to, to a hospice. Um, one of the things I don't think we do as well as we should is the area of bereavement, but hopefully in the future, um, that'll be an area that we can work on. So this is what we would think of as the new model of um, integrated palliative care. Um, one other slide that I wanted to share with you, and those of you who have been with me in presentations before, know that I like to discuss or share with you some ideas around what I call the paradox of palliative care. And I'd like to share just you know, some information about how with early palliative care and, and early involvement, that people not only have um, the experience of better quality of life across those whole domains of total, total pain, but they may also have longer survival. I mean, there's a famous New England Journal of Medicine article, which gives us some empirical evidence about you know, those with um, lung cancer, how with early palliative care, they survive longer. And certainly in my own experience, I knew one person who, um, more than one, several, who we thought was going to die in, the, in August, but with the palliative care referral um, and just a, a simple um, assessment, hol holistic assessment and some use of steroids, that person was able to breathe better and they actually, they left the hospital and they went home and they were home until January and they were not expected to survive in, um, until January. And I actually had the, um, conversation about funeral arrangements back in August. And, um, and it was wonderful to see this person survive because of a palliative care um, involvement and referral. And I will tell you the spouse of this particular patient after um, uh, when they came back in January, she was effusive in her gratitude to the palliative care doctor. She was also so grateful for the role that the chaplains played in that sort of addressing total pain um, in the, um, for her husband and, and also for the quality of care that, that they got in the hospital and in the community. Um, I also just kind of wanted to share with you something too, uh, um, uh, uh, which I would think of as a simple logic. If pain is under control, and let's just say if total pain is under control, the person would want to live longer. And you know, it makes kind of sense, right? If you're in a lot of pain, you're gonna be saying, oh God, I just wanna die, just take me. I can't do, deal with this anymore. And that can be angst, it can be physical pain, it can be other things. However, if we can address pain, address um, psychological factors, social factors, the person may say, you know what, I want to live. Um, there's a wedding coming up in a few months from now. There's a graduation coming up. I want to live, I want to be present for that. So there's a simple logic to it, but there can be other um, 
other contributors like um, the assisted living that help us. This next slide I just wanted to share with you that the, about the ideals of palliative care. Um, palliative care, the goal is to help you live as well as possible for as long as possible. It's the right care in the right place with the right time, the right team, and the right communication. And the right team is, I mentioned to you, I mean, on an ideal situation, you would have a, um, you'd have a number of practitioners and resources available to you, but I know this is not always the case because I know in rural areas, you may not have access um, to some professionals that could be helpful. I, we were having a discussion about uh, um, people with difficulty breathing and, and the fantastic role that respiratory therapists can provide. However, respiratory therapists in the community are few and far between, but they can be extremely helpful. And of course, right communication, we need to make sure that our information moves from one point to another point. So each uh, person involved in care can know what's current and know what the findings are in order to make the best recommendations for treatment. Now I'm gonna, I'm almost coming to a conclusion, but I wanted to share with you just some of what I see as the desired outcomes in palliative care. Um, one is certainly an earlier referral to palliative care. Um, I share with you stories about um, the paradox of palliative care. And when I do community presentations, uh, we, we talk about this a little bit more um, because I want people to be less afraid of palliative care. This is the second point here, diminish fears about palliative care because there's an, a fair number of people in the community who, who when they hear palliative care are frightened um, hearing that. And so we wanna try to diminish that. And I think if we have an opportunity to get into faith and cultural groups, community organizations, uh, culture, um, and, and speak about palliative care uh, before a crisis situation, hopefully we can encourage people to be more comfortable um, with accepting and or a referral for palliative care. Um, another desired outcome of palliative care is that we want to have uh, care in the setting the person wants. I mean, if they want to be at home, that's great. Many people are uncomfortable with somebody dying at home, so they may want to have a hospice. Um, I wish in Ontario we, we had more hospices so that there was, this would be an option because they are smaller and more home-like. Certainly we have some good palliative care units, but I think we need more in that sense. And sometimes people may even need to go to hospital if um, pain and symptom managements are not, pain and symptoms are not being well managed. Um, but hopefully we can avoid hospital admission, admissions, especially during this time of COVID. Um, as we said earlier, one of the desired outcomes is that we can ensure a better quality of life from the physical, social, psychological, and spiritual point of view. Um, and don't wait to the end of life for a palliative care referral. Um, too often we say, oh, somebody's gonna be dying in the next short while, and, um, and then that's when they make the referral. And, and I think then it's um, perhaps it is not the best time. We need to try to move palliative care to an earlier point of um, in the illness trajectory. I mean, and, and one of the ideal situations I saw was an oncologist sitting with a palliative care doctor and they were going to be sort of aggressive in the therapies they were recommending, but made the person aware, here's the palliative care doctor so that when time comes, that resource is available to them. The other point that I wanted to make too that and my desire and my hope is that with earlier engagement of palliative care and with its holistic approach for caring for a person, we hope that we can reduce some of the referrals for euthanasia, for medical assistance in dying. And I think that to me is a, a goal that I hope we can achieve. But as others have said so, um, several times today and yesterday, palliative care is, is not as robust in our provinces and our country as we certainly um, would wish it to be. And as I, as I come to uh, wrapping up, I wanted to just share these few words with from Ramdas. Um, and, you know, I, I like to think of um, as health care providers that we are accompanying people on their journey, on their journey of care. And I loved what he said and wrote here. We're all we're all just walking each other home. I just love, love the connotation of that, of walking down this path with people and walking each other home. Um, assisted, assisting them. I will leave this screen for another point in time. Um, my, my slides have some resources. Uh, Pallium Canada has some terrific work that the, they've done. Canadian Hospice Palliative Care has some terrific work and certainly um, the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and um, is a very good resource and tool. And I will say thank you for um, 
for allowing me these uh, few minutes to share some thoughts with you about the philosophy and practice of palliative care from my perspective. Thank you very much.